Hello. Uh, tonight, what we're going to do is um, foreign currency trans uh, translations. Oh, good news! The ebook now has a numbering system, so that's a <laughs> that'll be a plus. But um, so tonight we're going to start with the uh, foreign currency uh, translation, and this is when. Uh, the way it kind of goes along with chapters, uh, well, like we just got on chapter three, is that a lot of times you'll have a foreign subsidiary that you'll be combining into the, um, you know, with the parent company. A lot of times you'll have, it's not unusual to have a subsidiary overseas someplace or in Canada or Mexico or wherever that has, um, that you'll combine, you know, with your, um, when you do your consolidations. Now, the problem is, is that they use different currencies. So whatever country that it, it, they're dealing in, you're dealing with, they have different currencies and those, those currency rates, translations between US dollars and whatever the foreign currency is, those fluctuate, they go up and down. Sometimes they go up and down for just natural reasons, natural economic reasons, whatever they are. One country's do, you know, doing this and going through this or whatever. And sometimes they are purposeful. So sometimes a government will, for instance, one of the things that governments like to do if they have unemployment is to devalue their currency, make their currency worth less. And you, you know, at first you say, well, why would they do that? <laughs> Well, they do that because it makes their products cheaper than everybody else's. So their products are cheaper, more people buy from them, increase the employment. So one thing countries do is they um, uh, will devalue their currency. And by the way, one of the, thing, one of the problems with, the, with Europe where they have their Euro is that individual countries generally have a hard time devaluing uh, whatever it is, you know, if, if they had their own currency, they, they could devalue it. But because they don't have their own currency, it's all, you know, all the, all the members basically have the same currency. Uh, it makes countries less, less able to, to do those kind of things. A country like China, for instance, China devalues their currency and they do it because they want employment, they want to have the exports, um, bringing money into the country. You know, that's why they devalue their, their money. Now, there's also um, another way that is uh, another reason that is common to have devaluations. Excuse me, and that's countries that have a really hard time with their tax system. Their their tax system isn't very effective, so they have to run the government. So they run the government by printing more money, and that's when you sometimes you you hear about hyperinflation or something like that. A lot of times, those countries have high inflation because Obviously, the more money they print, the less it's worth. So in those countries, a lot of times you just try to get, get it out of that currency and get it into a, uh, some other currency, either US dollars or euros or whatever it is. But it's, it, it's because, again, they're, they're, they're tax, they're, what they're basically doing is taxing everybody who's own, who has that currency because it's, it's devaluing that currency. But again, they're usually doing that, not necessarily to get business, but they're doing it to, uh, to run the government. So anyway, long story short, these rates between what a foreign subsidiary does and what in US dollars, you know, those rates can make a difference as far as when you're, when you're translating those dollars into uh, US currency. All right, and we have basically two different ways of doing it, and it depends on what the functional currency is. Let's go ahead and pull up a handout here. Oh, tonight, uh, chapter 10. I, I have this in the syllabus as chapter eight. Uh, I just noticed now that it's uh, chapter 10. So <laughs> if you're looking at the syllabus saying, well, what happened to chapter eight? Uh, Chapter eight is not chapter 10, and I apologize for that. Okay, um, let's get rid of that. Sorry, I lost my, here we go. 
All right. Um, I have it. I have it in three different forms. You have PDF. You have Excel, and you have uh, Word. I'm gonna go ahead and do it in the Excel. <clears throat> okay. The, the, it's the same information on all of them. All right. Um, the two methods that we're going to have are when they have the money, when it's kept in US dollars, they're going to use the temporal method, which we'll get into in a minute. But that's when you have a country that, for whatever reason, you're taking their currency and translating it into US dollars and bringing it into your operation. In other words, it's very intricately involved in your operation. You're bringing the money back to the United States. Um, you're, you're, you're translating. It could be because you're in one of those countries that is devaluing their currency for whatever reason. So you wanna transfer it into US dollars as quickly as possible because if you hold on to it, it's gonna be worth less. So the temporal method is when you have a, a foreign subsidiary, but you basically operate it in the, the functional currency is US dollars. That's when you change everything as soon as you can, usually. Um, and again, it's usually for countries that have, um, uh, the, for whatever reason, the, their currency is being devalued. <clears throat> okay, uh, gains and losses are reported in regular old net income. Uh, if it's the functional currency is foreign currency, in other words, you're going to leave them the currency in the foreign country that is going to be kept in that same currency, we use the current rate method. And you are going to keep it in that currency, uh, probably because you're just going to leave it over there. wherever it is. I say over there, it could be in Canada, it could be up there, it could be in Mexico, it could be down there. Whichever it is, it could be, you're gonna leave it there. And there's one other thing to, to talk about this for just a minute, and that is, um, so a lot of times you'll have, um, they'll keep it in the foreign currency because again, those operations need cash or, you know, and not US cash, but their cash uh, to go on. And so leaving the currency over there for them to use is, you know, might be pivotal to their operations. There's also another factor that comes into this and that is um, tax rates. A lot of times to entice businesses, other countries will give less tax rates. So if the tax rate is say 20% in the United States, somewhere else they might say, tell you what, we'll only tax you at 8%. So, you know, you into this foreign country and they'll tax you at 8%. Now, here's the kicker. If they tax you at 8%, if you bring that money into the United States, the United States is going to say, oh, wait a minute. You didn't, <laughs> you only paid 8% on this. We got to tax you the other 12. So when you bring money in the United States, that difference between the U.S. tax rate and whatever the foreign tax rate is, um, the U.S. taxes companies for it. So because of that, a lot of companies don't bring in cash into the United States because it's taxed at a lower rate in the other countries, and they can use the you know the full force of that currency in those countries when it's only taxed at say eight percent rather than twenty percent. So yeah, it's kind of complex. I mean, that's kind of this, you know, kind of different thing. The, the, the biggest one I ever heard of was Apple. They had a deal with um, Ireland that they would not pay any taxes, no corporate taxes. And they had literally hundreds of billions of dollars worth of euros that they wanted to bring in the United States. And they didn't do it because they would get taxed with the, you know, the full U.S. tax, uh, you know, because they're paying zero, the full whatever, 20% or whatever it was, they were going to get hit with it on literally hundreds of billions of dollars of uh, currency. Okay. All right. <clears throat> 
So um, a couple differences here. Uh, the US dollar uh, is called the temporal method. Uh, I'm not really sure how they came up with that name, but the temporal method is basically what they, what they use. You'll generally find that for the most part, current assets are gonna be valued at the current rate, whatever the current rate is on the balance sheet. If they are, um, well, especially the longer term assets are gonna be done at the historical rate if it's a temporal method and at the current rate if it is the um, current method. And you have to remember, the one thing you have to remember about a lot of these too is that you're gonna be transferring those at the, um, at the, at the, at the, at the historical rate of whatever it is that you, you paid for them, and you transfer that in, that's gonna transfer in at the same amount. Because for the temporal method, you're translating it into US dollars immediately. All right. Uh, let's go down to, look at all the income statement. The income statement is kind of interesting. And that is for the, uh, if, if you don't, if you're operating in the foreign currency, it's just gonna be the average cost for everything. The idea being that, okay, you, um, you, know, you make some sales in January, some in February, some in March, some in April. So you take an average for, all, for the year for the stuff on the income statement, because it happens with you, you know, your rent expense happens throughout the year, your you know, advertising expense happens throughout the year. So you take an average. When they talk about doing it in US dollars, though, functional currency is US dollars. When it comes to some of the expenses that are based on assets, we have to go to the historical cost. What was the actual cost of it way back when? And the reason for that is because those are valued at basically frozen time at the US dollar rates from back in that, you know, back in the period of time. It's almost as if you've taken that company and brought it to the United States, even though they're not using dollars, brought it to the United States, but that, you know, that those, especially those long-term assets are all going to be in there at whatever they were you know, whenever you bought this thing. And if you bought this thing in 1962, it's going to be at 1962, right? So, you know, it's, it, these can really go back far. Okay. You know, let's just jump in and do these. It, it's not as, it, it, going through these is a little tricky. It's not as hard as it might seem. I mean, I mean, let me see, I might, I might pull up a second. You know what would be, you know what I should do? And this is, I should do this in the future. I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna copy this into the problem. If you want to be cool like me, you can do it too. Just to have the two methods up here. Um, I think I'll make it. <laughs> that probably made it worse. Do it like that. Okay. Um, so here we have a company for problem one. Uh, the function of currency is the British pound. So we're gonna keep it in uh, the British pounds. Which method are we gonna use? The temporal method or the currency rate method? Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Oh yeah, the um, so the functional currency is in British pounds, 
And so which method are we going to use? We have these two methods. We have the one based on US dollars and one based on foreign currency. So which one are we going to use? The temporal method or currency rate meta? Yeah, current rate meta. So we're going to use the current rate method for this one. <laughs> okay. So current rate method is one we're going to use. Um, that's the one we use. For. So we're looking at this over here. I like that one. So this is the one we're using. Actually. Since we're using that one, I can kind of make a mess out of this. Maybe I won't do that. Okay, so we're going to use this over here. This uh, this one over. Here. Okay, so let's go to the exchange rates. Um, so it's kind of like a two-step process. We have to know which rate we're looking for, you know, average, composite, blah, blah, current, whatever. And then we have to go over here and see if we can find it up here at the top. Okay, so let's go to the income statement. It looks like everything goes on at the average rate. All right? So income statement. So we come over here to the income statement and pretty much everything's going on the, on the average rate. There is one to be one exception. That's gonna be this one here, which we'll talk about when we get to it. But everything is, you know, for instance, they're going to have revenues throughout the year. They're going to have cost goods sold throughout the year, blah, blah, blah. So the rate we're going to use is the average rate. So here we're going to do this overall average rate. Uh, let's make that I don't know, some color. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to translate that into US dollars. Okay. So the revenues, again, we make the re we made the sales throughout the year. Some in January, February, blah, 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 blah. We're gonna take the average for the year. Okay, on average, you know, take all 12 months, average them, and you know, we're gonna use that as the um, as the average for what we're going to translate these dollars in. Okay, and you know, I should just type that in. That's what I should. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. And I'm going to do the same thing here. And I'm going to add uh, some of these. A. And in this case, this should also be, you could also translate this at 125 because these are at 125. That's not always going to be the case, though. And you'll see that. Um, here, you know, at, if you go down to the, uh, if you got the temporal method, the cost goods sold might be at a different rate than the, uh, the revenues. So anyway, this is going to be our, um, <clears throat> gross profit. 
come down here, we have operating expenses without depreciation. We don't have to worry about that for this one because this is all gonna be, well, most of it's gonna be anyways. At 125. Depreciation expense. You'll notice that that is at the average rate also. Everything's at the average rate for this one pretty much, except for this gain on sale of equipment. You'll notice that this did not happen throughout the year. This happened on 4-30-21. So because this is not a transaction that happened throughout the year, it's not like sales, it's only happened once and it happened on a specific date. We're gonna take that specific date for the translation, the, um, the rate. Okay, so 4.30, so what for? Uh, yeah, let's make it look. I should change the order of this thing. I should change the order of this to put the income statement at the top. Okay, so let's take a look here. We have to, oh, I didn't multiply that other one. We gotta do that. You'll notice that's a gain, so it's a plus, it's money coming in, so that's why that's not negative. And so we'll take uh, from the 130, uh, yellow. so 137,500. And so we'll sum these up. Any question on that? Okay. <clears throat> now, um, beginning retained earnings, this is the first year. The company was purchased on 1-1-2021. We come down here to beginning retained earnings. I know over here it says that it's a composite, which we'll talk about later. But for the first year, it's going to be the historical amount. It's when we purchased this company, that, these were the retained earnings when we purchased them. So this is going to be the retained earnings on the historical date for this first one. And I'll show you how, why they say composite over here. Okay, so uh, let's make that up. Orange, or whatever, whatever color that is. Oops. So like it's translated at that, uh, the net income is right here. I 
know why they have the, the default line color is light blue for the arrows. That makes no sense. It's so you can't see it. Okay, so net income was that. Dividends declared and paid on 9-1. Okay, that was a specific date. Six. see that. Uh, okay, now here, here's why, here's why they say that retained earnings is a composite rate. A composite rate means, a composite means it's made up of more than one. You know, there's more than one rate. There's multiple rates. And if you look at this, you can kind of see that. Right, I mean, uh, for instance, this income statement, there's two rates here. There's another two rates in the statement retained earnings. So this 281 is really made up of multiple rates. You know, 125, 122, 130, 126. This is made up of multiple rates. So this is why, um, the, uh, oh man. This retained earnings, when they say it's a composite, oh, hold on a second. So when they say that this uh, retained earnings is a composite, that's because it's made up of more than one rate. You know, it's got, and this is just the first year, 125, 122, 130. But yeah, as time goes on, they could have hundreds of rates in there. Okay. <clears throat> I am definitely going to change this around when I do this again, put the income statement on the top. Okay, uh, balance sheet. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is inverted. Okay, so uh, you'll notice that pretty much everything goes on at the current rates for this. So the current rate is of, you recall that uh, the, the balance sheet's done at the end of the year, you know, 1231 or whatever their year end is. So the 1231, that'll be the current rate at the end of the year. That's what those dollars will be translated at, whatever that ending current rate is on 1231. That will be what we translate this at. Okay, so the current rate is that down, I'm gonna give it a color. Turquoise. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So these are pretty much everything. Now, the inventory, talk about that for just a minute.
it is possible that the inventory would go in at the um, uh, at a different rate, but virtually always it's going to be at the market rate. And I'll tell you something else about um, as far as accounting for foreign currency or, for, or foreign um, foreign enterprises. Most of them use the international accounting standards. Those international standards virtually always say you have the inventory at the current market value. If you have it at cost, you adjust it to the market value. So even though they sometimes will say, oh, it might be at the cost, that's usually not the case because usually they're using the international standards. International standards are that you put it at the market value unless it's impossible to get the market value. There's some things that there's not really an active market for which you can't get the market value. But if you can get a market value, that's what you use. And even more so than the United States that they're, they're kind of sticklers on that. So we're just gonna go through ahead and go through with these as uh, The liabilities, we do that at current rate. So coming down here, same rate. And that's kind of like uh, if we, you know, at year end, if we um, were to pay off these liabilities, you'd pay them off the current rate. Because remember, the, this is not in US dollars. Common stock is going to be at the historical rate. And that is that 130, I think. Let me go back up here. Yeah, the historical rate will be the 130. So this, um, oh, let me copy it. Retained earnings will be 281. Okay, this will be our total liabilities and equity.
And normally in accounting, we'd be crying right now. <laughs> I took a balance. <sighs> okay. Well, uh, usually it doesn't balance. <clears throat> we'll have a foreign currency translation. Um, So let's see the translation gain or loss. So these are the assets we have. This is the liabilities that we owe people and kind of what we owe the owners. So the difference here, let me just subtract these. Uh, just a quick question for the retained earnings. I don't see any rate there. Right, because we're taking it right from the this up here. So this is the re, this is the same retained earnings. No, this is the ending retained earnings. As a matter of fact, this really could be even just called that. And that's going to be a composite, you know, it's going to be a, a bunch of stuff in there. You could find out what the effective rate is. Not sure what that would be. It'd probably be something in the middle of all that, I guess. Composite rate is right around 129, 9.5, something like that. Okay, so this is seven. So this will be the translation gain or loss. Now, which do you think this is going to be? Is this going to be a gain or a loss? So this is how much assets we have. This is how much the stuff that we own. And this is what we owe. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing. Yeah, this is a gain. It's gonna be a gain. Yeah, so the, the thing you got to keep in mind when you're doing these, um, the income is going to be a composite, usually, often. And, you know, that's just going to come right down into here. So you're not going to actually do a translation for the income. It'll be whatever you have from the income up here. And same thing with retained earnings. That is just going to come straight down here. And, uh, yeah. I think I came up with like 129 something. And you kind of see that the translation here, most of it was at 130, a little bit, 18,000 of it was at 126. So you know it was going to be close to the 130. And so what this would be, where this would be shown is gains and losses reported in other comprehensive income. It can be, uh, have you guys talked about other comprehensive income in your other classes? Uh, something when you do it for the um, investment stuff, they'll talk about it. Uh, other comprehensive, there's actually two income statements. There's the normal income statement that we're all used to. And then there's this comprehensive income statement. 
And originally it looked like the United States was gonna be the only country that uses comprehensive income. It shifted. Now <laughs> the international people are using it too. So there's regular income and then there's also comprehensive income. And the comprehensive income is more of the complete theoretical amounts that go in there. And the reason why they put it in comprehensive income is because it, it happened, but it actually hasn't been translated into dollars, in, at least in this case anyways. We actually, even though it's showing us a gain of, well, whatever, 7,000 something, lost it, here you go. Even though it's showing a gain of that, remember, we're not gonna translate this into US dollars. This is gonna stay in the corn currency. So the next year it might reverse out, uh, you know, it could go up or down. Now we're not saying it didn't happen, the, the currency changes it didn't happen, they did, but um, again, these are less likely, these are more theoretical rather than uh, concrete that, you know, this is how much gain we have on it. Any question? I have a I have a question. Yeah. So with the inventory, uh, for the rates we have to, uh, you said it's historical, right? But we have two historical here. We have one that says inventory is historical and the one that is historical. We use the one that was historical. Oh, for this one? For the rate, yeah. yeah. Why didn't you use the 1.23 for the inventory? For this one? Yeah, why didn't you use that one for the event? Um, that is, let's see here, I, that one is used for um, here, inventory and historical cost. And, and, and this is a little bit of a, it, it, it was, it's used for the temporal method, which we'll do next, actually. So it's sort of like this. Um, This method, you know that if it's at net realizable value, you do it at the current amount. If it's at uh, inventory at cost, you do it at historical. I can tell you that virtually always is gonna be there, this right here. Is it possible it's here? Yeah. If it's some, if it's some, if it's some kind of inventory that you can't get a current rate for, uh, it'll be there. But um, for the most part, you're gonna be dealing with this. So this method, you can actually do it two different ways, depending on if they have it at net realizable value, or if they have it at historical cost. Uh, but, um, so when do we use it? If, so we use a historical, right? We have inventory historical. So I'm just asking, oh, okay. I'm just asking, so how do you know which one to use? Uh, it depends on the method. Oh, okay. Yeah, so because we're using this method here, everything goes in at current. Now, yeah. when we do the other method, which we're gonna do next, the temporal method, we have to make a choice of whether it is going in at the historical cost or at the current. I most of the time it's gonna be at the current in real life. But now here, but here's another thing, they're not to muddy the water too much, but they, um, <laughs> the inventory at cost is really complex. It can be because it, you know a regular company, they're gonna be buying stuff every day, right? So, Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So, so the rate is going to get weighted generally by the purchases, you know, that they made. So, if they made it, you know, it, it really can get complex. That rate that they show you at the end of the year for the inventory, the historical rate, that will definitely be a composite because that'll be throughout the year as they made purchases. What was the rate when they made those purchases? And the, the temporal method that we're going to be using next. Because it's in US dollars, it's as if we paid those in US dollars, even though we paid them in British pounds or lira or whatever it was. So just like in the United States, whatever you paid for at that time, that's what the cost is, um, is it's gonna be the same for them. But it, again, the international standards though, even though you keep track of the cost, at the end of the year, they value virtually everything that they can at market values. So a lot of times you'll still be using that current value rather than, you know, the, um, the historical. Because they're gonna value it at year end 
you know, at 1231, what's this worth? So the net realizable value, is, uh, they'll have that as the, uh, and, and whatever the, the rate is at that date, they'll have that in as the current. And the same thing for the um, cost of goods sold, a lot of times will go in also at the, uh, at the current rate. But we're going to we'll use the, we'll use the historical for these, and we'll uh, let's we'll see what the next problem is. So the next problem is exactly the same one, except we're going to use the um, copy this over. You know, I'm not going to copy that one over. Copy a clean one over. <laughs> and I am definitely going to change these around so that the income. Uh, statement comes first. I think the reason they do it is because of this. But anyway, I guess it doesn't matter too much. Okay, so I'm going to go to problem two. Uh, let's see. I'm going to come down a little bit. Okay, so this one is exactly the same, except that we're going to use US dollars. And so we use US dollars, it's going to be uh, the temporal method. Oops, what did I do here? There we go. And the temporal method is, I'm going to hide this. Cool. Uh, the temporal method is a little bit more involved. It's a little bit more involved. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move this up. <laughs> just because. <laughs> I'll leave it down there. I'm going to have it up here so they can take a look at it. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to be doing the inventory stuff. Uh, okay, inventory is that market rate at the end of the year. So we'll do it. We'll do the current rate down here, but we'll do the historical cost for uh, the rest of these. Okay. So let's go ahead and do this. So the revenues. Average just like we did before. So throughout the year, they'll take an average inventory, uh, average uh, rate. Most expenses are going to be an average. Now, here's where this historical cost so you were asking about before. So this is what the historical cost is going to come in. These cost of goods sold. So cost of goods sold. This is going to be done at the historical rate. So let me get turquoise, I guess. So so this is going to be that historical rate. Oh, I didn't multiply these. What am I doing here? Multiply them and they didn't uh, format these. I, I, I got to redo this. I, 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 I did this kind of in a hurry. I should have should have left it the way it was.
Okay, so now notice that this is not going to be a nice one-to-one -one ratio here. What we get? Okay. There are two different rates here. So the rate between this, it'll be somewhere in between these two if you wanted to calculate what it is. But, uh, you know, it's, it's not gonna be a one-to-one -one rate. Okay, uh, most expenses going at average cost. So operating expenses without depreciation will be again for this one. I'm gonna bold all these. Depreciation expense. Depreciation expense will be historical. And again, because it goes back to we paid US dollars for those goods and We're going to use those the US dollar rate that we paid for those goods back in the day uh, when we translate. Gain on sale, that's going to be the same as before. Here. Okay, now this is really gonna be a composite number. This is gonna have three different um, rates going on. Any retained earnings again at the beginning of the year, because this is the first year, it'll be the historical at first, but then it'll get muddied up here. I, I'm going I'm to go back to problem one and see what the in income was. It should be different. Oh, yeah, look at that. Quite a bit different. So the income is... Yeah, 8,000 almost? More than 8,000. Okay, the gain retained earnings. So this will be in at the historical rate. And again, this is because it's the first year. After the first year, it will not be at the historical rate. Oh, I can't see that. Hold on. I'll make it purple up. The lighter purple. Okay. And this income will just be from up here. Uh, 
um, if I can do this or not. Can I paste it over here? Hey, I can. Look at that. Dividends were paid um, again at one point in time. So we're just going to take that uh, date that it was paid on. We didn't use blue yet, did we? No. Okay. And I gotta find a color for that. Ran out of colors. Going out of colors. Oh, here I gotta get more things. I didn't do this. Okay. So uh, let's take a look here at the, uh, so we have cash. So these all go into current rate. We don't have anything with current rate yet. Man, I'm back here. Yeah. Ooh, this color. Or how about this one? Yeah, we'll do that one. Okay, so these are, the current rate now it says that the inventory is at the market rate so the inventory is not at cost is that the net realizable value that i cut off here so we're going to use that inventory at the current rate because of this it says done at the market rate which is going to be the current rate at the end of the year so at the end of the year they they've taken it they've, they've valued it at you know, at whatever it is in the foreign currency, at the end of the year, they'll think of the value for that inventory. They're also going to match that with the rate at the end of the year because they've translated it into current, um, you know, the current market for that in British pounds, I guess it is. So the, the rate's going to be at that same date, the date that they translated it at, at, at year end. And by the way, that's very common. Um, I have to look, you know, look around to find out where that didn't happen. Okay, so let's see. The market rate is two. And the seal is going to be the same, and inventory is going to be the same because we are not doing it at cost; we're doing it at the market rate. And again, very common. Property plant and equipment is going to go on at the historical rate. darker. All right.
Okay. Uh, current liabilities at current rate, deferred income, which I'll talk about in a second, historical and uh, long-term debt is at the current rate. Deferred income is, is unearned revenue, basically. It's when someone pays you ahead of time. You can't recognize it right away because you haven't earned it. So whenever they paid you, that money that they've taken, you've taken it in British pounds. Now remember, the functional currency is US dollars. So at that point in time, you translated it into US dollars. So that's why that would be at the historical rate because it actually was transferred into US dollars at that point. Now we don't have any unearned revenue or deferred income, so we don't have to worry about it, but that's why that historical thing is there because when that money was received, yeah, we're using the functional currency of U.S. dollars. It was translated into U.S. dollars. That, that's why this one is like that. We don't have any of those, but if we did, we'd be doing something different. Okay, so uh, current rate for the liabilities. Think about it, if we pay it off today, these liabilities, that's what we're going to do. Uh, yeah, oh wait, I got a thing. I can't remember what I did that at. Come and stack, it's a, at the historical rate, I believe. Where am I at? Historical rate. Retained earnings. I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal this arrow. Retained earnings is gonna be that. Okay, so see if we can come up with the gain or the loss out of it. That's a loss. Sorry about that. My allergies are just killing me. Um, yeah, it is a loss. Okay. Uh, so 635. Uh, I'm going to leave. Do something. Is it $5,000? Yeah. 
Paul? Uh, yes. Yeah, so they have 635 in assets, so they, and they basically owe 670. So yeah, so this would be a loss. of 5,000. Now, if you look at this though a little bit, I mean, realize that up here, the income was 60,000, you know, and you have this loss of five, right? So you're like, what, 55,000 something. If you come over here, you know, it's not that different of it. It's, it's, it's you know, 52 and I but the gain is seven, so, you know, I guess it is about 5,000 more on this side. But yeah, it, it, it depends on the method. And quite honestly, you know, for something like this with the British pound, it's probably just going to be a little bit dumb luck, whether they it's a gain or a loss. And this would go right through the regular income statement, because remember, that this is all already um, translated into US dollars. So this will be, you know, on the, it, it's realized because it's been transferred into US dollars. So it'll actually have been realized of a loss of 5,000. So that just goes on as regular income. So you'd pick up the 60,000, whatever, for income in US dollars. And then you'd also recognize this $5,000 loss in US dollars. Okay, oh, we're, we're over, aren't we? Uh, let's go ahead and take a break. Uh, we'll say be back in um, seven nine. We say seven uh, seven sixteen. How about? <laughs> Tell you what, we'll do we'll do problem three together, and then maybe we'll do uh, I'll let you give a shot to problem four on your own. But when we come back, we'll do seven. Scratch that. We come back, we'll do problem three together. Or you know what? Actually, maybe we'll do the other one. Problem three is easy. I don't know. <laughs> we'll decide that at seven sixteen.
I'll tell you kind of a funny, I used to be an auditor and I had friends that were auditors and one of my friends was doing an audit and it was a big bank and they had literally, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in income and all that. And uh, they were, so doing this audit and banks, if you look at banks, they, they get out their financial statements really quickly. The, the audits up for financial statements are, I mean, they literally get them done in days. I mean, sometimes they get their, their um, financial statements are released you know, on the 10th of January or something. <clears throat> Whereas it might take a month for some companies or even more to get their financial statements up. So anyway, um, you know, really tight time schedule for banks. So they're getting right down to the end of it. And uh, this foreign uh, currency trans uh, transaction, you know, the translation from one of their uh, foreign subsidiaries, a, a small subsidiary came through and it was like for, you know, I don't know, 30 or $40,000. Now this is a company that has, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of income. So the chief financial officer says, forget it. We're not going to restate it. You know, we're not going to restate it. It, it. it won't even show up. You know, if you round things off to a million dollars, it's not even going to show up. So forget it. We're not going to put it in. Uh, you know, we'll put it in next year. It'll be in whatever. Um, it, it, it's not material. And the auditors agree, you know, it's not, yeah, it's not material. Um, but <laughs> the uh, controller said, well, you know, they had this automated system that would do the bank reconciliation. Oh, you know, it's automated, you know, it was do a, commu a computer and this, this would show up as an exception, you know, around there. So the, you know, the controller, the head accountant put in a, a journal entry that was just one number. <laughs> it was just a, a, I think it was a debit actually. I think it was, a, it was an increased cash by like $30,000 or something like that. Or also to throw out this error report. So he put it, it was just, but he couldn't change the income because the CFO said, I, you know, you we're not changing the income. So <laughs> he had this journal entry of just one, and, 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 you know, somehow he got it into the system. And, you know, if you actually looked at the run of the general ledger after that, it was off by like $30,000 of debits and the credits. But they he just did it because he wanted to, the automated um, uh, system to do a bank reconciliation. Anyway, okay. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. We'll do problem three. Problem three together. Well, I'll give you guys a choice. Problem four is harder, but problem three is easier. We'll get out quicker. So which one do you want to do on your own? Problem three or problem four? We'll do the other one. Anyone? Let's do problem four. We'll do problem four? Okay. All right, problem four. <clears throat> and again, this one, because everything is translated into uh, US dollars, and you know, the translation going, on, and, and this is uh, more along the lines that it is actually happened, you know, it's not theoretical, it actually is changed into US dollars, so. All right, I'm gonna do it like this. Uh, no, this is right, because this will be a second. Make it into normal proportions because we're going to be using the temporal method. So that was the same method I had highlighted there. Uh, let's get rid of all the formatting here. Okay. So we're going to be using the temporal method again. It's a more difficult one because it basically is as if you transfer everything into US dollars at the time. So instead of just leaving it in the foreign currency, which would just you know, be either at the average or the current rate for most stuff, um, it'll actually be in as if you had transferred it at that uh, time. Okay. Revenues and most expenses. Is it not like the 
uh, problem one because problem one everything was in uh yeah it's, yeah it's it's easier because for the most part your income statements all at the average and your balance sheet stuff is all at uh, the current rate which is the year end rate so you know when you when you when it's in the foreign currency when you're when you're not bringing the money in the changing it into U.S. dollars. You're not doing that. You're just leaving it in the foreign currency. The income statement is on the average throughout the year for the most part. Balance sheet stuff is almost all, <clears throat> except for the equity stuff, it's almost all in at the um, current rate at the end of the year. So at the end of the year, you like make your balance sheet at the end of the year. That's the rate you use. Income statement stuff is to make sales throughout the entire year, have expenses throughout the entire year and all that it goes in at the average. So it's almost always average and then balance sheet end of the year stuff. So it's, it's, it's a lot easier just because you don't have all this transferring it into US dollars that goes on. Okay. Oh, wait, I got your all. No, I'm in the wrong one. Okay, here we go. Okay, so uh, average. Yeah, so this one's a little bit trickier because you're going to have these historical costs that creep in. And again, and these historical costs, for us, it's not too bad because the historical cost is on the first of the year. But you can have anything you buy will have a new historical cost. So if you buy a new piece of equipment, it'll have a new historical cost. Whenever you bought that equipment, that's a new historical cost for that piece of equipment. This method can get really tricky really quick because you can have, you could, it's not uncommon to have hundreds of rates for, you know, the historical cost for things. Okay. So revenues are done at the average rate. And I'm going to go ahead and do the other operating expenses without depreciation. We'll do those at the uh, average rate. Cost of goods sold is going to be at the historical rate. Mm -hmm. Let's make it. Uh oh, we don't have, we do have 622. Okay, here we go. Never mind. We do have that. Let's make it. I must be formatting here. Try this again. Sorry about the formatting here. We'll have to redo these, uh, be a little more friendly.
Okay, so this is our, and again, this is a composite, more than one, so. Cannot be right. I did something wrong here. Right, it doesn't look right to me. Oh, 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 it is wrong. Hold on. This is my bad. That's the inventory. This is the rate we should use for this. I knew that. Did I make a mistake on the other one too? I made a mistake on this one, guys. It looks right. They have one point two three, which is a historical number. This is this is, this is a different historical. This is the this is the historical for the equipment. I made a mistake here. This is my bad. Let me check and make sure I'm not, no, I do have that solution here. I don't know why I didn't check on, check on number two. And yet I made a mistake on this one. Uh, before we do anything, let's, let's let's correct my error here. This Which question is that this is number two, problem number two, and this depreciation expense should look like this. It should be this one thirty here, because this there's two different historicals going on here. This is a historical when we first bought it, which would be when we had the equipment that we're depreciating. This inventory historical will be uh, for just the inventory for the year. So you notice that there's two historicals here. There's one for inventory and one for everything else. And this goes with the inventory. The cost of goods sold will use the inventory one. This is correct. This one is not correct. This one should be 130. I apologize. And that'll change it. stupid thing to do. Yeah, so I'm, was, everybody, let's go to page two and make sure we, everyone gets this. And I, again, I apologize for that.
So there's two historical rates. The, the inventory historical rate is going to be a, <clears throat> excuse me, a much more con convoluted one. Because it'll be all throughout the year, whatever you bought stuff at. Whereas this will be a one rate whenever you had the equipment that you had. Kicking myself for not catching that earlier. Okay, let me, <laughs> let, me, let me check to make sure I did this one right before we go on. Where's the... Okay, I finally got this one right. Yeah, the other one is wrong. Okay, uh, I'll stop. Any questions on that? <laughs> Probably a lot. Like. Yeah, uh, just a quick one. I just wanted to make sure if uh, the net, so what would be the net loss? Would it be 4,125? Uh, good question. Yes. Yeah, and, uh, you know, uh, go ahead and update the numbers here, especially if you're doing this by hand. Um, let me see if I can get it out a little bit so you can kind of see. Because it's yeah, what a bad place to make an error in the income statement it changes everything. Uh, yeah, so this is what it should look like. All right, let's go back to this one. Okay, so this will be the, uh, and again, these historical costs are, So this is based on the inventory. Stuff that we sold. And this is based on what we actually paid for the item uh, historically. It'll be one date and time for whatever it is. Okay, beginning retained earnings will be the original historical cost. What am I doing? <laughs> Not even putting numbers in now. Uh, That income will be from up here. Dividends, uh, ten thirty one. Hey, I already used that color. Next. Okay.
Right number. Yeah. You know, I'm going to check on my sheet. <laughs> I've lost all my confidence. My confidence, I've lost what I'm doing. Here we go. Yes, that's right. <laughs> All right, start to get my confidence back now. I did. I did one correctly. Okay. So coming down here, we're going to do these. Are going to be at the. Is this at the? Yeah. This is the inventory is at the market rate, so it's going to be. That they've gone out and we use turquoise yet? Yeah, we did. Orange? No. So it's at the market rate, so we're going to use the current for the inventory on this. Which is common. That's usually what you do with it. So, so these will all be done at the uh, current year end rate. Property plan equipment will do not the historical cost, which would be the beginning historical cost, not the inventory historical cost, but the beginning historical cost of Here. <laughs> okay, I think that's it. Total assets would be that. All right. And again, this is it's very common to have this happen. The inventory had never realized we'll value this will be at the end of the year. So you use the end of the year rate, the current rate at the end of the year, which is you know, 1231, because you valued it at the end of the year, you use the same rate to, go, to match it. And again, with uh, international standards, that's virtually always the case. The only time that wouldn't be the case is if it was like um, some, something you couldn't readily find the market value for. Um, then you would go with whatever the historical cost was. If, like, if you had no idea what you know what the market rate was, but their international standards are, I think, are actually pretty good about saying you know trying to determine what is this that we have, what's the value of it. And you know, in the United States, we tend to stick a little bit more to the historical cost, but um, yeah, okay. Uh, liabilities, these are going to be at the current rate, except for deferred income, which we don't have. So these are all going to be at the current rate. In other words, if we were to pay off these liabilities, what would we today, what would we have to pay them off at? And that would be at those amounts. Continue to make mistakes. Here we go. All right. Kevin Sack, I know this one. 
And total there would be, why do they keep doing this to me? <laughs> Let's try this again. There we go. So we have, 1,040,400 in assets. We owe basically 1,028,280. Um, so the difference is uh, gain or lost. Gain. The gain. Yep, gain. Yeah, we have more assets than we have the liabilities, basically. Yeah, it's going to be a game. Well, sorry about that. I what I was thinking. But yeah, this is it. Yeah, so this is uh, and again, this one's a little bit more convoluted than the problem three one. Problem three is a little bit easier just because it's not as involved. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> None that we're going to trust you with. But yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, see if you can work out problem number three on your own, and uh, we, we'll we'll go over it next class. I think I might pull out one from the book for the next class. The, yeah, the page numbers are, are actually they, they work now, so I'm all excited about that. But um, yeah, so, so next class, uh, see if you can do problem number three for next class. Now I know that we have a, a test due Friday. Test due on Friday. All right, and I think I've already entered this handout to be turned in next week. Uh, I'm gonna postpone that. Uh, I think I have it due on the 11th. I'm gonna postpone it to the 18th. I'll do that right after we get done talking here. But anyway, uh, so any questions on that? Okay, see if you, uh, see if you can give uh, problem three a try and uh, I will talk to you uh, in a week's time. All right, have a good evening. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye.